Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Karen Lawrence. I'm the Assistant Director of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and we're so pleased to be doing um, this program in, in combination with the League of Women Voters um, of Greater Cleveland and Delta Sigma Theta. Um, that I know a lot of you um, were looking forward a year ago plus um, to our suffrage symposium where uh, Professor Giddings was going to join us live and then of course the world exploded um, and so we're so glad that she could join us. Yeah. And, and do this as well. Um, and I also know that a good number of you were um, at the earlier program um, as well presented by um, the City Club of Cleveland, um, where, where Professor Giddings um, gave the talk entitled Missing from History, Black Suffragists and the Right to Vote. And so we're very pleased um, that, that you could join us here for this more, more informal um, Q&A um, that is going to be led by Sia. And so I will introduce Sia, who will then um, take it away for us. Um, she's an Emmy and award-winning journalist who's the weekend anchor and reporter WOIO TV, um, which is the CBS affiliate here in Ohio. She's a skilled multimedia journalist, priding herself on shooting, reporting, writing, and editing um, the majority of her reports for multiple platforms. Um, she's been featured on national shows such as TV One's Fatal Attraction, Oxygen Snapped, and the Investigation Discovery Channel. Um, she has her Bachelor's of Art Journalism, Bachelor of Arts Journalism, sorry, from Indiana University's Ernie Pyle School of Journalism and a Master of Science in Journalism from Columbia University um, in the city of New York. And her master's thesis was an award-winning documentary film about a Harlem muralist that broadcast on public television stations around the nation. Um, and she is also um, a member of the public service sorority Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Um, and so I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for, for moderating this, Sia. Thank you, Karen, for that warm welcome. Welcome, everyone. And uh, I have the distinct honor to welcome our special guest, uh, Dr. Paula J. Giddings. Welcome, Dr. Giddings. Oh, thank you. It's good to be here, Sia. Yes, it's so good to see you. So I'm just going to read a short, uh, a very shortened uh, bio. Uh, of course, it's not all encompassing of uh, everything that you've done. Uh, but for those who, uh, who don't know, Paula J. Giddings is a Elizabeth A. Woodson 19, 1922 uh, Professor Emeretta of African Studies. She is the author of the book, When and Where I Enter, The Impact of Black Women on Race and Sex in America, In Search of Sisterhood, Delta Sigma Theta and the Challenge of the Black Sorority mo mo uh, Movement, uh, and most recently, uh, the biography of anti-lynching activist Ida B. Wells, Ida, A Sword Among Lions, uh, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Biography and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Now, Ida, of course, was deemed one of the best books of 2008 by the Washington Post and uh, the Chicago Tribune, and it earned the first inaugural John Hope Franklin Research Center Book Award presented by the Duke University Libraries. The book was also the Lolita Woods Brown Book Award from the Association of Black Women Historians and the Outstanding Book Award from the Gustavus Meyer Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights. Giddings is also the editor of Burning All Illusions, an anthology of articles on race published by The Nation magazine from 1867 to 2000. She's a former book editor and a journalist who has written extensively on international and national issues and has been published by The Washington Post, The New York Times, The Philadelphia Inquirer, The Nation, and Sage, a scholarly journal on Black women, among other publications. Before attaining her position of professor of Africana studies at Smith College, Giddings also taught at Spelman College, where she was a United Negro Fund distinguished scholar, Douglas College, Rutgers University as the Lori Chair in Women's Studies and Princeton and Duke Universities. Giddings joined Smith College in 2001. She served as the editor of the Meridians, Feminine, Feminism, Race, Transnationalism, a peer-reviewed feminist interdisciplinary journal that provided a forum for the finest scholarship and creative work by and about women of color in the US and international context. 
She also served as the department chair and honors thesis advisor for the Department of Africana Studies. In 2017, Dr. Giddings was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Giddings. Well, thank you, Sia. Yes. Good to see you. And it's always so nice to see people finally I've been corresponding with and uh, been helped by with Karen and, and Michael. And so good to see you all. Thank you. Dr. Giddings, I want to start with, uh, with uh, one of the quotes from your book. You say, you wrote, only the Black woman can say, quote, when and where I enter, in the quiet, undisputed dignity of my womanhood, without violence and without suing or special patronage, then and there the whole race enters with me, end quote. Anna Julia Cooper, 1892. Talk a little bit about that. And of course, Anna Julia, uh, uh, Julia Cooper is probably one of our really first uh, uh, feminists in terms of what she wrote and, and published uh, there in 1892. Uh, and what she's talking about has really been what uh, Black women activists particularly have always uh, imagined and and uh, worked upon, which is that that if Black women are free, everyone's free. If we have dealt with gender, if we have dealt with race, if we have dealt with class, and which Black women uh, uh, represent, uh, then you know we are we are all free. And so this has really been something that's really inspired a lot of Black women's uh, activism, uh, but also, and of course, being at the center of racial progress as well. All right, thank you, Dr. Giddens. I wanna start, uh, we have a couple of questions. Okay. At a lecture several months ago, a distinguished historian, Martha Jones, suggested that women in 1919 to 1920 should have waited to get the vote until all women were included. Do you agree? Would you give your comment on this perspective? Uh, well, uh, practically speaking, I don't know how, how that could actually work itself out. But I tell you one thing, how I feel about it is that certainly at the very least, uh, women, white women should have uh, worked in coalition with black women to make sure that they were enfranchised. Uh, and we know and the sorry history of the suffrage movement and their marginalization of uh, black, of the predominantly white suffrage movement and their marginalization of black women. Sometimes what we don't realize is that even after the amendment was passed, they wouldn't help black women, right? Who had uh, problems of course, uh, particularly particularly in the South. So if there had been a coalition uh, that uh, involved uh, white progressives, including white progressive women and blacks, because you know, black men were often very, very helpful, and particularly in the NAACP and all, when, when white women wouldn't help, the predominantly org white organizations, of course, the NAACP was very important. Uh, in working with Black women to get them uh, enfranchised, as well as other organizations. So, if, so we missed that great opportunity for a coalition. And you know, uh, but women's progress in general is always aided through coalition. It's always the women's movements have always been uh, uh, very much uh, inspired uh, and also progressed. In the wake of black movements, when black movements reach a certain peak, so do women's rights. That's all throughout uh, history. And so uh, we all would have certainly been uh, better off if there had been an, a, an active coalition, at least certainly before the amendment, but at least after the amendment uh, uh, would have made a tremendous difference in our history. Thank you, Dr. Giddings. You talked uh, earlier today when you gave your talk uh, in conversation with uh, the City Club, and you were talking about uh, the 1913, uh, the suffrage, the uh, march on 
Washington. You talked about uh, how Black women were told to walk in the back and right. not in the front. Can yes. you talk a little bit about <clears throat> that? <clears throat> Excuse me. This was, of course, was a major, <clears throat> this was a major march of women's suffrage. It's uh, uh, just before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. Uh, and uh, uh, thousands of women descended on Washington, D.C., and delegations of all the states, uh, in, in that, practically all the states in the country. <clears throat> so it was very, very important as a national, as a national moment. And even though black women were, uh, and there's a lot of sort of confusion about the directions, who gave the directions for black women to march in the back, you know, later on, everybody denied that they did it. Uh, the, uh, 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 but what is important, and what's also important about this is that uh, despite uh, those orders, and we know that Ida B. Wells in particular was ordered to not march with her predominantly white delegation, but in the back and that she refused. I think most of us know that, that story. But it's important to know that women in gen black women in general uh, refuse to do this. And because there's lots of now really bad history that says that women actually did, mar black women actually did uh, march in the back. But I've been looking at this closely uh, <clears throat> recently because of a article in the Washington Post, actually on the deltas, Delta Sigma Theta, of course, we know uh, their first act, public act as a sorority, was to take part in this uh, suffrage parade. Uh, and, and the article in the Post said that, that the Deltas uh, marched to the back. And, uh, and I knew that this wasn't didn't true, and I did some more research, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's not true. They marched in the educational section uh, of the parade. And, and there's also other literature, contemporary observers who look at where black women were marching in the parade and, and no one says they marched in the back. And, and W.E.B. Du Bois, in fact, in the crisis, and really talks about how women, black women refused to do that and they marched in their various uh, delegations. And, and I think this is just an, very <clears throat> important to understand because black women weren't taking they, they weren't going to let anyone make them march <laughs> in the back. These women are confronting the Ku Klux Klan back home. <laughs> you know, they're doing, I mean, of, of such tremendous courage and uh, 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 <clears throat> throughout, their, throughout, throughout their activism. And I think it's kind of an insult to say that they would march in the back. There's no way they were going to do this. And <clears throat> the other, <clears throat> and I uh, won't keep going on and on, <clears throat> but the other thing that's important about this is that we have to remember black women were involved in this march, not just because of the march itself, which was important enough as a national phenomenon, but they were back in their own cities and towns. They were mobilizing women, uh, particularly in the North, they were mobilizing women uh, to vote. And, and, and if they were uh, made to, if, if, if they had let themselves march in the back, it would be a, a terrible uh, blow to the entire movement. Uh, Ida B. Wells is an example of that. <clears throat> the, uh, before the march, uh, there was a law passed in Illinois uh, that women could vote in municipal elections. And she was mobilizing women, uh, black women particularly, to affect some of these uh, elections in Chicago particularly. So she was not certainly gonna let anyone have her uh, march in the back and then and put a damper on the movement. Thank you. Thank you for correcting that history. Uh, you often talk about how you are a journalist uh, yeah. who writes <laughs> about history. You yes. Know, so that, I mean, it's, so it's important to uh, correct the record, especially Absolutely. when it's wrong. Yes. We have a question in our chat. And okay. since you were talking about uh, Ida B. Wells, who is a hero, yeah, how did you yeah. decide to write a biography about <laughs> Ida B. Wells? And talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I kind of, uh, and this is how biographers talk, so excuse me, I kind of met Ida <laughs> when, 
I mean, she died in 31, everybody, but, but she sort of came into my life when I was writing um, uh, my first book, When and Where I Enter, which talked about the impact of black women on racial movements and on uh, gender movements, uh, women's movements uh, throughout history. And so a lot of, of course, researching a lot of women who I was talking about. And then when Ida sort of came into my view, she sort of said to me, um, you know, these, all these women you're talking about are important, but I'm the most important, <laughs> you know? And sometimes biographers talk about this, that a subject sometimes seems to choose them, you know? Uh, and, um, uh, and so I had to talk to, I said, look, Ida, I, I have a lot of women to, to write about right now, but I'll come back to you, I promise. <laughs> and um, so, and so I did, uh, but I always had a, a tremendous attraction to the kind of character that she was, which is a, a character of tremendous courage, not just physical courage. You know, we know, we know she started an anti-lynching movement practically by herself in the South in 1892 uh, and was ready to defend herself uh, um, if, 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 if need be. She bought some pistols. Uh, when she started her uh, anti-lynching columns. Uh, um, but she also had a courage of conviction of, and, and a courage of when, even though what she was saying, when no one really believed it, when she was really undermined, because she's also, she's talking about, and not just violence, but sexuality as, as a part of her anti-lynching discourse. She's a woman, she's, a, as, as you, we may know, some of you may know, she's orphaned. She's single for a long time. So she's doing this kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, a, 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 in, a, in, a, in a solitary way as well. And uh, getting uh, uh, so much um, criticism. Uh, uh, and yet, you know, she just had a feel, she just knew she was right. And she just went straight for it. And then she has a, one phrase, she said, even if the heavens may fall, I'm going to do this. And the heavens did fall all around her, by the way. Um, so that kind of courage is, is, has always been attractive, uh, been attractive to me. Uh, I'm, I love to talk about an, an activists who just uh, have a, in this kind of prophetic vision who, who will do what they need to do no matter what the circumstances are. We have, we have a follow-up question. If uh, Ida B. Wells were alive today, do you think she would be a journalist, a politician, or an activist? Uh, well, she's a, she's, she would be a, a, a journalist, I think, uh, and an activist. I think that, that she was both uh, uh, um, in, her, in her lifetime. <clears throat> Um, but you know, she, which is another thing that attracted uh, me uh, to her was her journalism, her investigative journalism. And at one point she says, you know, in journalism, I found the real me. Uh, and once she started writing, she just knew this, is, this was in her DNA. Uh, and she remained a journalist, of course, all, all of her life. She also believed how that works with her activism she has another phrase that says, she says, you know, the people must know before they can act. So it was very important to inform people that as she would talk about the truth about lynching and the truth about what was happening in the, in the black community and to the black community. And so, uh, and she loved language um, and she learned to be a, a, a tremendously persuasive speaker uh, and writer as well as well as an as an activist. Thank you, Dr. Giddings. I have to, um, you know, wonder. Uh, most of us uh, that took a traditional path in journalism, we were always taught to just uh, report the facts, leave the emotion out of it. Uh, but of course, uh, last year, you know, when uh, when we were fighting, still fighting, uh, two <laughs> pandemics. Uh, a lot of uh, Black journalists uh, took a step forward and talked about those things on the record and, and put it into their reporting. 
Can you talk a little bit about that? <clears throat> uh, I, I think what, what one needs to do in, in journalism is to, uh, your main objective, I think, is to uh, tell the truth as you know it and tell it in a way <clears throat> that, that, uh, that not only informs people but if you're an activist, it also helps them to act in a in a particular way, and so um, and there so there are all forms of journalism. Sometimes um, it's fine to have the basic basic facts, but I think there's also a space for a more a more personal uh, view. Uh, um, you know, there's a, a historian I like by the name of Barbara Tuckman. And she had a great, I think, phrase. She says, you know, uh, she says, we don't, we shouldn't worry so much about bias. Bias is a function of education. It's a function of judgment. That's how you, be, that's how you become biased from one thing to the other. She said, the only thing with bias is you have to let people know, no, that's what you're doing, you know. Uh, and as once you, know, people understand your perspective, I think then, uh, uh, it's, it's fine to be more, more personal, but I think it is important uh, to state or, or let people know your bias, uh, which uh, to me doesn't take away from what you're saying. We have a question about who are some of your favorite uh, historians and journalists today, since we're on the topic? <clears throat> My goodness, there's so many. There's so many good, uh, I'm not going to get in trouble. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I'm not going to get in trouble with it. Number. But um, I, 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 I uh, encourage uh, people to look uh, on the website of the Association of Black Women Historians, particularly, and to look at what they're writing. The writing is, the, some, the history is so good right now. There's so many, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, there's so much brilliant, um, uh, 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 so much brilliant history that's being written right now. It's like an aperture is open. It's like, you know, and uh, we're seeing things that we've, that we, we haven't seen be before. Plus with technology now, we have more access to digital kinds of information, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it's, uh, it's, so that's, so that's quite extraordinary. <clears throat> um, the one thing is, and, and this is what I'm working on right now, is, uh, you know, the history is there. The history of everything that we, almost everything that we need to know is there and is published. What we don't have is the history that's a part of the story. We don't have the narrative, the, 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 the main narrative that is, is written in a way that, uh, we see uh, organically the central role that Black women, in particularly, uh, play both in women's movements and in, in race movements. And part of this is just the way we tell the story. So the history is there. Now it's time to pull it together into a narrative, you know, for those of us who don't have time to read. <laughs> History, a lot of history books. I was laughing because I'm I'm trying to write or, or talk about that narrative. I mean, I have 50 books on my desk because you're talking about you know the black women here. You're talking about race here. You're talking about predominantly white women doing this. You, you, then you're talking you're talking about the country doing this. You, and who has time to do that? Uh, so I think the next thing is just to to think about how do we write the new story uh, of black rights and women's rights that puts uh, black women in their proper place. Earlier today, you uh, talked about uh, black women and how they were missing from history, from the suffragists, from the right to vote. Uh, they were ignored, you yes. know, can we? <clears throat> uh, yes. the. Um, uh, you know, this is part of what I've been talking about. <clears throat> we start the women's rights movement with Seneca Falls, 
1848, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, and the people that gathered in that little town <laughs> in upstate New York, and call that the beginning of the women's rights movement. And, uh, uh, and but, but look what that does. That's, a, that's what I call an origin narrative. As an origin narrative in which all the women are white, as an origin narrative in which their really concern is individual rights, when everything, so many things are going on around them, uh, you know, the, 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 there's the issues around the expansion of slavery. There's the issue around uh, Mexican American women trying to hold on to their property uh, during the war. There's a, there are concerns around Irish immigrants uh, coming, coming in from Europe and German immigrants <laughs> because of the uh, uh, civil war that's go going there, going around there. You know, so we're, we're talking about all the things that's happening in the abolition movement and black women abolitionists who are raising all kinds of questions. And yet we have the origin narrative of women's rights uh, of this little, this little meeting in, in Seneca Falls. And what we realize now is that there are certainly much more important meetings that went on before and after uh, Seneca Falls, much more consequential. And we also know that at least one claim to the origin of women's rights from Lucretia Mott in 1837, who says that she feels her, her organization of anti, the world anti-slavery, the anti-slavery women's conventions, uh, in the 1830s was really the first time women's rights were really discussed in a, in a very uh, vigorous uh, way. And she says, that's the, that's the beginning of the movement. You can talk about beginnings and beginnings are always pretty tricky. Uh, but I, I like Lucretia Mott's suggestion because her, that conference that went on in New York in 1837 was interracial. Black women were in leadership uh, positions. They were talking about uh, race and slavery uh, as well as uh, um, uh, gender rights, in, you know. And so, uh, and it was um, uh, so much more significant to me in so many ways. And if that was our origin narrative, if that was our origin narrative, it'd be very, very different. There's a the, there was a meeting in 1837. The next meeting was in 1838 in Philadelphia and um, where mobs really surrounded the, the women uh, when, when they were meeting uh, and they had to exit their building. They actually burned down, actually burned down the building they were meeting in. Uh, and the women, and there's a description of the women leaving uh, to get out of there, but they, and they left uh, black women and white women arm in arm uh, to, uh, for, for each other's protection, you know? And I think about that image and I think about, boy, if that was our origin narrative, we'd really think about this very, all of it very, very differently. All right, thank you. We have a question here uh, in the chat. Do you have a perspective on Sojourner Truth? She also became a hero of the movement. <clears throat> I'm gonna say something kind of sacrilegious. Uh, you know, I'm not the greatest fan of Sojourner Truth. I have great respect for Sojourner Truth, of course, and for what she's done what, and, and what she did. But, um, and this is probably not her fault. Boy, I'm gonna get in trouble now. This is probably not her fault. But you know, she was one of the few black women who kind of sided with Susan Anthony uh, and Stanton about the 15th amendment about allowing, that allowed men to vote and not women. And was one of the few black women who said, yes, no, there shouldn't be any amendment if women aren't also uh, given uh, the vote. And she's one of the few black women who Anthony and Stanton 
really talk uh, about in their history of women's suffrage, I think because she agreed with them. Um, uh, <clears throat> And 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 the, and maybe thoroughly not her fault, but they kind of used, She was kind of used as this figure, kind of exotic, you know, figure in terms of white women, who would say these thunderous things. And oh, please, so uh, so I so I have a uh, so I have mixed feelings about uh, about Miss Truth, but at the same time, but you know, we can have those feelings. Obviously, I take things very personally. <laughs> We can have those feelings and still very much respect who they are and what they achieved, which I did, uh, and, uh, and empathize with the kind of life that she had. I'll always remember, you know, there's a, uh, she had someone write, uh, wrote a, a biography of hers. Uh, 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 and I'll always remember this, what she said, she had a child and she said, and the child would cry because the child was hungry. And she would beat the child. And she explained that no black child can afford to cry because they're hungry. I mean, what kind of choices in life is that? I mean, how difficult is that, right? And that was always very poignant, very poignant to me. And I think it's also in some ways as a metaphor of how sometimes we punish each other to keep each other strong, you know, in the face of adversity. So, uh, so I have great respect for her, but politically, I, 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 I just have a different point of view. It's okay. We're not all a monolith. It's okay to have a difference of opinion, <laughs> Dr. Kidd. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. I, uh, I have a comment and a question here from Meredith Turner. She says, thank you for your commitment to ensuring the inclusion of African-American women in your discussions of American history. I loved Ida. How did she handle Victorian morality? Was she definitely ahead of her time? Uh, oh, she was so ahead of her time, but this is why she also got in trouble. Anyone ahead of the time is they have, they have a burden to bear, believe me. Uh, but this is a great question because sometimes we forget uh, that black women, uh, that black people were actually freed during the Victorian period. So not only did we have to deal with all that race stuff, we had to deal with all that gender confusion <laughs> at the same time with the Victorians. This is a, this is a very difficult road to navigate. And there is a phrase <clears throat> that I think says, uh, be, without having to explain a lot of what, what Victorianism is, but there's a, a phrase that someone used in describing it saying, it was a, it was a Victorian uh, culture was about radical innocence. Uh, and as we can think about what women were supposed to, you know, uh, true womanhood and, uh, uh, and purity uh, and, you know, character was destiny. And so the Victorians had to lie a lot because uh, because everything had to be kind of perfect on, that, on a certain level in public discourse. So, uh, uh, so, so Ida is also grows up as a Victorian herself. You could you could see it in her diaries and in some of her writing. But what she understands is of that if she's going to understand and what what I said follow the logic of lynching, she's going to have to break through. Victorianism. She's going to have to use direct language. Ida is one of the few people who even use the word rape, you know, much less talk about it. She has to talk about interracial sexuality. This is why she gets in so much trouble, interracial sexuality. She has to talk about white women who are really sexualized. They're not pure. Uh, they're sexualized and they are not, um, just victims of, of these rapacious black rapists, that there are actually consensual liaisons going on in the South. And this is getting some black men killed when it's discovered. So she has to really rip open all of, of this. She also says, and, and Victorianism is about respectability. On, a, on another level, she says, you know, respectability is okay but it's not an agent of change. That 
yes, we should get education. Yes, we should accumulate wealth and all of that. That's fine. But don't think that that's going to give you first class citizenship. You're going to have to protest. You're going to have to use civil disobedience. You're going to have to use, you know, all the tools that we have. Uh, 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 and um, uh, this got her in a lot of trouble, you know, as well. Uh, so, so, so she really leaves Victorianism behind in terms of language, in terms of ideas around morality, in terms of what is really going on uh, in the culture. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite significant. She really makes herself into a modern figure uh, as she follows the logic of lynching. Good trouble, no? Good trouble, really good trouble. <laughs> good trouble, I'd say. Uh, you know. Yeah. But you know, the, yep. you know, she was, I was just uh, also, uh, it let her, left her open to so much to slander. You know, mm -hmm. the, you know, the New York Times, my favorite slander, slanderous charge against her was the New York Times actually, listen to this, actually called her a dirty minded mulatress. I mean, you know, please, right? I mean, uh, and she was accused of all kinds of sexual improprieties, you know, as well as other things. So uh, uh, it's a difficult road. That's what I'm talking about, the courage of conviction to be able to get through all of that and still follow what she felt she had to follow. We have a question here from Dorothy Miller. She says, many origin narratives not only skip over important things, but lie, especially today. Do you think we will return to more accurate narratives and actual truth telling? Well, I hope so. And I want to say hello to Dorothy Miller. We had some wonderful correspondence. Uh, she was my first correspondent in our in this engagement. And uh, so I'm glad to, to, to hear from her. And I thank her for uh, <clears throat> what she's done. Um, uh, uh, it's interesting, you know, there's a, a, a historian has written something called, the book is called The Myth of Seneca Falls. It's just a brilliant book about how uh, the myth of Seneca Falls was constructed uh, as the beginning of the women's rights movement. And what the author, though, makes a point in saying is that she, she was, she's not talking about myth as falsity necessarily, but myth as this venerated story, right? That gets passed on. Now, if the story is constructed in a particular way, it's gonna leave out as uh, Dorothy is alluding to, it's gonna leave out certain things which could be construed as a lie. <laughs> you know, it's gonna add certain things that certainly can be contested. Uh, so, uh, so we have to, so a lot of things is just demystifying uh, what these, these, these paradigms are, are created to sort of to help us through. What we're seeing now, of course, and this is a great example of what's going on now of all of this legislation, voter suppression legislation, based on a myth of that, you know, uh, that Biden stole the election from from Donald Trump. But look at the trouble this kind of myth making can make, right? Uh, so we have to demystify that as well. It's just hard, once you use the word lie, which, which is not inaccurate, but once you use the word lie, you know, people really dig their heels in and there's not much you're gonna be able to do with them. But I think if we talk about uh, uh, the meaning of, of myth and why it is presented and what it wants you to do. Uh, I, I think it's a little bit, I think there's a little bit more grounds um, to uh, come, come, uh, to come to some truth telling uh, in, the, in the society, which has really suffered. Thank you for that. We have a question here from Heather Burton. She says, I have quoted Ida, a sword among lions, many times in writings, specifically around the prophetic voice and her role in ministry through advocacy. What are your thoughts around why the Black church 
does not recognize her role in ministry as that of Emil Towns or, or Marsha Riggs. Uh, 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 Emil Towns, I, 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 I used uh, a, a, her work a great deal in uh, writing about uh, Ida. Um, uh, I, Ida uh, is a tr transgressive personality. <laughs> Uh, and uh, she is is so um, refuses to fit in to certain frameworks that it's uh, that it's she's hard to embrace by certain institutions. Uh, and so uh, uh, and. Uh, and, and some of this is also, we think about that uh, as a religious uh, question, but there's also a lot, there's also politics, you know, involved. And Ida was one of the few people who would really, who really uh, uh, criticized heavily uh, ministers. You know, she, she is uh, ministers who were, who she felt were corrupt and who weren't doing what they should do in the, in the community. This is a period, she's coming of, of political age in an interesting period. It, this is the period when the great black denominations are really flowering, right? Late 19th, early 20th, early 20th centuries. And there's a lot of, the, and there's a lot going on uh, politically. Uh, uh, and, uh, um, and lots of challenges and there in this in, in earlier periods there's lots of also challenges of women to the institution of the ministry which 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 was so um, uh, of which men just had such a such a, a stranglehold over right uh, and so uh, so so I think it was largely a, a political it's my this is a clumsy answer to saying that it's a political issue uh, more than a religious one. Dr. Giddings, they would like for you to talk about uh, Shirley Chisholm and her career, and especially for some of the younger people uh, that may not know or be familiar with who she is. Shirley Chisholm was so interesting. I'm, um, I'm, 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 I met her, uh, once, we 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 both um, were uh, spent time at Spelman uh, College, uh, and she had just was finishing up a year, and I was coming in. In fact, I was going to live in the same uh, faculty apartment that she was leaving, and so uh, and she was a delightful she was a delightful person. You know, one at one point she said to me. Um, you know, Paula, she said, you know, she said, you know, I have to do something. She said, most of my friends are my age and they're just too old. I need to know, I need no more young people. <laughs> you know, my young people is my friend. She was very funny. Um, uh, but she's another figure who is, I mean, I think we know the, 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 the general facts about her running uh, for president, uh, first black, black woman to run for president on a major, in, in, on a major party. Um, and this and and the uh, but the things that are very important that more than just that representational aspect, which is important. But when you think about Shirley Chisholm and, and when you look at her campaign, we also have to understand the coalition that she was able to put together. I mean, she put together uh, the coalition and particularly young people, right? I mean, no one did that uh, as well as she did before she did that, right? So she brings young people as well as blacks and 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 and, and whites and a, and a pro and a progressive uh, coalition. And so it's, it wasn't just her running, uh, but how she ran, and what is the path that she that she cleared uh, for those uh, that that followed. Uh, uh, of course, before uh, before running for president, 
she also had to struggle of course she, as 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 we know she was also a, a member of the you know the house of representatives uh and i tell you when you get through when you read what she had to go through in brooklyn politics <laughs> to get to that point right and then she's another figure almost like wells who just says this is the right thing that i'm going to do i'm going to do it uh, people are going to dislike me for it. As we know, she was very, very uh, controversial uh, um, uh, as, an, as an assertive, transgressive female. On, on, uh, uh, and, uh, and men, uh, and a lot of men, there were men who supported her. Uh, uh, and people like the Black Panthers supported her, which is very interesting. Uh, but then, of course, there were those who really uh, were very were very cruel and thought uh, that she was stepping in the way of a black man who should be uh, who should be the first to run uh, for president. Uh, so uh, it's a very it's a very interesting it's a very interesting history. She's an interest interesting and courageous figure, uh, and 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 as I love a transgressive figure. We have a question from uh, Amy Jacob, Amy Jacoby. Uh, she says, is there a connection between today's anti-union initiatives and the fact that many women of color are working in professions that could use support? Would Ida have supported unionization as a way to promote equality? Uh, uh, no question about it. Uh, Ida was actually, when you take the list of what she's done, it's just amazing. One of the things that she did was to help A. Philip Randolph and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, um, who he had, you know, he had organized the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters uh, in New York, but had trouble organizing a branch in Chicago, where Ida was obviously where Ida was living. And of course, Chicago was key. Chicago was the home of Pullman, <laughs> as in the Pullman Porters. Uh, and Pullman had a lot of uh, had a lot of had a lot of influence in Chicago, and had actually had given a great deal of money to a lot of black organizations and uh, and black groups. So had a lot of leverage with with black groups. And so when A. Philip Randolph comes. Uh, to Chicago, uh, uh, he has a hard time attracting anybody to come to his meetings uh, because of, of the sway of Pullman. So they contact who, of course, Ida Wells Barnett, who brings together women <laughs> in, that, in the club movement there in Illinois and who invite uh, a. Philip Randolph to speak before them. And then who use their networks and their own leverage to men, men's groups and saying, you know, you have to listen to this guy and, he, and, you, and you have to take him into account and you have to listen because this unionization is so, this union is so important. Uh, and it takes, some, it takes a little bit of time but indeed, uh, more and more men begin to invite <laughs> A. Philip Randolph to come. Uh, and you know, and they had A. Philip Randolph, who was just who was a brilliant figure and who uh, would could, would debate would come in debates, and he would always just level people in a debate. And and he would talked about and why Ida liked him is because he was part of that new Negro movement, which was a militant movement, which was about not just prosperity, but about dignity. You know, the, the Pullman Porters, as you might know, uh, uh, all of them were by the, by the, by the clients, by the, by the passengers, they were all called George because that was George Pullman's name. So they said, here, George, no matter what your name was, here, George, <laughs> come, George. And he said, how can you do it? And they had to live off a lot of off of not very much uh, in, in wages, 
but off of tips. Right. Uh, which means that you have to be, uh, you know, if you have, you have to earn your tip, you have to be obsequious. So they brought out these kinds of issues uh, uh, and finally, and they, and they were successful uh, in organizing the union uh, of uh, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and maids uh, in, uh, in Chicago. But I just kind of started it uh, by bringing women together at the usual, right? Uh, and uh, so she very much believed in union in, in union uh, movements and and did some other things uh, as well. Um, this was a period, of course, um, where where uh, a lot of you know uh, if, if, uh, where blacks are always trying to get work. Sometimes they were used as scabs, you know, and uh, the butt of violence and. Um, you know, she would work toward. She would work with 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 all of that. But but uh, she's definitely pro union, and we need unions now. We need. Let's get them back. We have a question from Truri Ford. He says, "Can you excuse me? Can you talk more about the myth you mentioned earlier between lynching and the educated?" Uh, uh, oh. Um, there was the sense, and we remember it, well, maybe young people don't remember it, but even in our contemporary society, which is that, you know, if, 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 if someone got caught, was caught by police or uh, put in jail or arrested or lynched, they may not have deserved it, but they might have been doing. But why would they even be in the position to to be uh, 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 jailed or what? They must have been doing something wrong, right? Uh, and this went against this respectability notion, right? And there are a lot of uh, there are, or there are people who felt that if you left a so-called respectable life, you wouldn't be vulnerable to these things. You would, Booker T. Washington used to say, who was the head of Tuskegee, who was the big exemplar of respectability, who was, he, he used to say, he used to drive Ida crazy because he would say, um, uh, you know, no graduate of Tuskegee ever got lynched. Whoa. So, but what Ida Wells, as an investigative reporter, began to understand that respectability just isn't enough. And it sometimes made you the target of lynching. Uh, the lynching that sort of started her anti-lynching activism was the lynching of a, of a, 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 a very important uh, citizen uh, in, in Memphis, Thomas Moss, who was, who, was a, who was also a mail carrier who owned, who co-owned an important, you know, enterprise, a grocery store, and he's really lynched in the end because of his because he's competing successfully with a white proprietor. So Ida begins to say, you know what? The, reading a, a living, living, living a respectable life isn't going to save you alone, you know, and in fact may make you the target. Uh, and so let's let's uh, not bring together this idea of victims of lynching and of mass incarceration uh, and respectability. Plus, she said uh, she found out as she went and investigated lynchings and talked and 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 talked to people about the victims that a lot of these people were very respectable people. These weren't criminals, but the press criminalized them. The press made them, uh, and we we're, we experience that now. You know, the press is, you, you know, but she would go and she said, that, you know, they'd say he was a big brute who was, no. Uh, so, uh, so, that, so she delinks, which is really important, this idea of respectability and activism because the people who feel that all you have to do is have a is be respectable 
it makes you sort of not want to be so much of an activist, right? Because if you're respectable, you're going to be automatically a first class citizen and accepted. What's the point of, 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 of activism and getting people angry with you and, you know, uh, so she knew that that was a damper on, on also on activism. So she sort of turns, you know, she's a very important intellectual as well as an act, activist who mobilizes people. And she sort of turns that idea around. Very relevant, thank you. We have a question about you um, and how you attended Howard University, where you put yes. out the chapter, <laughs> yes. Blah, blah. <laughs> How do you feel about historically black uh, colleges and universities today? I, I'm uh, one thing I'm just thrilled about, you know, that they're getting some uh, support now, more and more financial support. They've always been, it's always been a, a difficulty with um, HB, HBCUs. So, so we're going to see, I think, a real, and with the attention paid to them now, also with uh, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, and and it seems like everybody, every other pe person now, all of a sudden, they went to Howard University or or another uh, black black college, which is which is quite wonderful. Uh, I I, I am, uh, uh, the, the black college experience was very, very important to me and to my, uh, to, to everything, to, to, uh, uh, to, my, to, my, to my career and to my sense of self and others, uh, other, other things. I would, I'd certainly do it all over again if I had the choice back then. But we also, I think, do have to also face some of the difficulties of, uh, of black uh, colleges and and have to do better on some on some issues. And I say this as a proud alum of, of Howard. Uh, there, sometimes there's a culture in those schools that are, that's anti-student. Sometimes there's a culture in which they're not taking care of, you know, I, <laughs> oh God, I'm in trouble again. I, but I, uh, I, I had the privilege and the honor of getting an honorary doctorate from Howard uh, two years ago, and I gave uh, a talk, uh, and I was talking about the history of, of uh, the great history also of Howard, of activists who come out of Howard. Uh, and I also, though, talked about things like my own experience, like we had, you know, dormitories that weren't up to snuff. And I mentioned this, and the students start cheering. I said, you mean they're still not up to snuff? <laughs> Or, you know, I talk, you, you, you know, and so, um, uh, uh, so, so we have to also. There's some work to be done on some aspects of uh, of uh, black uh, colleges uh, uh, institutionally. But I tell you, the experience though of being in a a, a black school where there is a black universe of people uh, from the diaspora from every, you know is an extraordinary experience that uh, that everyone should have but let's work on the other aspects of our of the of these colleges as well dr giddings you've been so gracious we really appreciate you answering all of these questions we've talked a lot about your work and some of your experiences but let's talk about you what do you like to do in your spare time Spare time. I don't have any right now. <laughs> I'm finishing up. But I'm trying to finish up a, another book. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I, I do what uh, what what most people do. I love I love the movies. I love getting together with friends. I can't wait to be able to have a nice dinner in New York again. <laughs> um, I've I've gotten very interested in film. Uh, you know, there's uh, I, my my book has been optioned, and we are talking about um, a TV series for Ida Wells. This is just this is so exciting to me to to uh, to talk to 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 young writers and to talk to people involved with these things. Uh, 
So, uh, um, so, um, so, so I love that. I've, I've tried to, I'm a very bad golfer. I started playing, uh, playing golf as a form of, but exercise and sort of fun. Um, and, uh, and that's it. I'm just sort of a, just, I think I just like the ordinary things that I'm a foodie. Uh, so, um, I, I, I love going to, to interesting uh, restaurants and interesting cuisines and that, and that kind of thing. Oh my gosh. Well, you said, uh, you said film, you said TV. So, you know, I have to ask who would you envision to play Ida B. Wells? I don't know. I need, I need help. Uh, with with that, who do you think? Okay. Who do you who do you think? You have oh. an idea? I don't see, know. Some, see some things I'm leaving up to the younger generations to think about, <laughs> see, yeah. like you. So 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 you know, That's it's good. hard. I I have don't think I. Of course I've thought about it, uh, and those I'm working with have thought about it. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, but it's hard to find someone. Who has that? And I'm, of course, I'm biased about this. Mm. They have to, but they have to have some depth, you know, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and some gravitas. And you know, we don't teach our actors and actresses gravitas. Mm -hmm. You know, Americans don't, right? So, uh, so it's hard to, uh, and we haven't had a lot of roles that require a certain kind of acting. Uh, and so, so it's hard to find uh, those uh, the, the people, but uh, I'm sure. But you know, I have this kind of spiritual sense of the person will emerge, you know, and one day you'll just look and say that that's it, that's there it is, there she is, right? So, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so I'm looking forward to that. That's that's fun. Dorothy Miller has another question, and I think this is a hot one. Someone well, told me you're writing a book with Gloria Steinem. Is that true? I am. I'm writing a book with Gloria Steinem and Beverly Sheftall. Okay. Dr. Beverly Sheftall, uh, the three of us, um, to uh, a book uh, which, well, it started because we were all we were all sick of people thinking that the women's movement is white. And we were all, we were talking about one day and we said, well, let's write a book to show people that it's the women's movement of the important role of black women in the women's movement. That's why I've been thinking about the myth of Seneca Falls and all that, of why, think about why we think the women's movement is white, even though we have all of that history that says it isn't. We have a lot of history that says it isn't. But we still in our mind's eye, when we think about the narrative, we think about as a white movement, and, uh, and it was interesting because the book kind of started as, you know, well, it wasn't gonna last this long with it, but it was kind of idea that, like hidden figures. Can we just show the black women who have been, haven't, have been overlooked, et cetera, et cetera. But then we said, no, it's not just that they were overlooked. It's, it's a structural way we have looked at even what the meaning of woman is that has a certain significance. You know, I hate this phrase, minorities and women. Well, where are the black women in that form, in that equation, right? You know, we're sort of assuming that the women, the white women and the, so we, so the way our gender politics is also has a lot to do with this. So we're, we're, uh, so we're writing a book around, around that idea because I, because not just for the history's sake, but I, I think we need to, and I'm thinking about and black women in particular, not exclusively, but in particular, I want them to embrace the tenets of feminism because it's because it will help us in our own lives and in our activist lives, right? And I hate it when it's rejected, even subconsciously, because I say, well, that's white women stuff. That's white women middle, and middle-class white women, right? But the women's movement, Women's rights movements has, have always been interracial. They've always been transnational. They've always been about low income women. Uh, uh, and, but that part of the history is hidden because of the way it is structured and told. 
Thank you for that. I, I look forward to that. I look forward to that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And that could be a good film too. Well, listen, hey. I think I can. <laughs> <laughs> My final, yeah, my final question for you, uh, Dr. Kidd, is when and where should Black women enter? Uh, wherever they want to, <laughs> you know. You know, the, um, I love our, our, and this is all throughout our, when we started with Anna Julia Cooper's quote, um, I love this sense that we've had always that we are, whatever happens to us is really important for everyone. So it's really a question of where are other people going to enter, you know, because we're there right at the center, right? Uh, and it's the other people who have not entered into a space and that we can work in a certain kind of coalition and understanding uh, to progress uh, as as a as a as a as a as a world as a as a nation you know as a as a as a as a group right so uh, 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 and we've always had that sense of being at the at the center you know uh, and that we're at the center not because not and not always the high achieving people at the center. But if you look at what's happening, what uh, the, the, for example, the black feminists on the left, you know, they were saying, well, it's the, our very oppression that gives us the key to unlock everybody else's oppression once we undo it, right? So, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so, and that's part of this, where I was talking about this, this book around women's rights struggles too. Once we understand that part of our history and that part of our thinking, I think it just opens up the world for us and opens up the world for other. That's the great thing about it. We, you know, we don't talk about individual rights that much. We're always talking about the race. We're always talking about the group. That's why we have this, why black women are so politically empowered right now. Uh, you know, is because we've always thought in those terms, even before we could vote. Uh, so, so we need to keep thinking in those terms, and uh, and uh, and, and I think uh, all of us will be better for it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Giddings. Thank you so much. Zia. Yes, you were for just a phenomenal person. Look, I want to show you my <laughs> hello, my, my hello. tired copy. With the uh, highlights. That's what I like. That's, that's what I like. The more dog-eared, the better. That's right. I said, oh my goodness, what an honor. What an honor. So, well, thank you. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you. you know, very we, much. we thank you for your time. Um, my goodness. I mean, City Club earlier, we've been talking about your book uh, with the Shaker Heights Library today. So thank you so much for uh, making yourself available. Thank you, so, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. You too, you too. I'm going to turn this back over to Karen Lawrence over there okay. at Case. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Hi there. You. Thank you guys. So that was an incredible conversation yeah. and Sia yeah. for moderating. And I also wanted to say, so we had a couple of technical difficulties at the beginning um, and, and Ruth Rollins, who's the, um, I'm going to make you a panelist right now um, so that she should be able to pop in, hopefully if this works. There she is, good. Um, we had some technical difficulties um, and, and Ruth Rollins was going to, to introduce Sia and then that didn't quite work out, um, but I do want to give her the opportunity to sort of wrap us all up um, instead, so. Hi, Ruth. Oh, our... Thank you so much, Karen, I appreciate yeah. it. Can you turn you on your love technology? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I am Ruth Price Rollins, and I'm the president of the Greater Cleveland Alumni Chapter of uh, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And uh, I will just take the time to uh, thank all of our partners, the League of Women Voters, uh, Lauren Alvin Siegel Lifelong Learning Program at Case Western Reserve University, the City Club of Cleveland, and of course, our chapter of Greater Cleveland Alumni um, to 
bring this finally to fruition after a whole year. So uh, uh, it's delightful. Uh, I, of course, want to um, uh, thank uh, Sia New Yorker and happy birthday to you. A uh, little birdie told me today is your birthday. Uh, oh, so happy birthday to happy you. Birthday. I'm sorry, I, 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 I had to be the tell, tell it all. <laughs> and uh, to our very, very own Soror, um, uh, Dr. Polly Giddings, thank you, thank you so much for writing all so of books that we have discussed during this entire series that started, I think, last week, actually, oh, and especially yeah. Ida, which has inspired this important and relevant discussion on women's rights. So we're so happy and we thank you so, so very much. And Karen, I will turn it back over to you with special thanks for letting me have a few words of thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so sorry again with our technical difficulties. I'm glad we could make okay. that happen. And thank everybody so much for, for being here. I'll just reiterate, thanks all around to, to Dr. Giddings, to, to Sia, to um, the League of Women Voters, to, to Delta Gamma, uh, to, to uh, Delta Gamma, sorry, I'm gonna mess it up unless I see it, sorry, Delta Gamma Theta. Um, and and um, also um, I'm, uh, in City Club, I'm now I'm all a mess because it's Friday afternoon and I apologize. Uh, but thanks everybody for also our attendees so for, for being here as well and taking part in for all of your excellent questions. And so thanks everybody and have an amazing weekend. And we'll Thank you. Again soon. Thank you to all as well. <laughs>